to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Uh, before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note today that the committee is meeting both in person and virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of the hearing. First, members and staff who are attending in person may choose to be masked, but it is not a requirement. However, any individuals with symptoms, a positive test, or exposure to someone with COVID-19 should wear a mask where present. Um, members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members who are, are responsible for their own microphones, uh, so please uh, keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Uh, finally, if members have documents that they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose e email address is circulated prior to the meeting. Well, good morning and welcome to our members and to our panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us for this hearing on preparing for the next phase of COVID-19. Over the past two years, this subcommittee has held a number of hearings on the pandemic, often with an eye to how lessons learned can pave an easier path uh, through health crises to come. But the current fight against COVID-19 looks far different than it did in March 2020, and we must consistently evaluate how existing tools meet our needs as case counts ebb and flow. Fortunately, national COVID cases have been going down since the Janu January Omicron peak, and after a difficult winter where the death rate has uh, surpassed the rate during the Delta surge, uh, spring has arrived. Around the country, mask mandates have relaxed, schools have opened, and now I'm chairing this subcommittee here in person for the first time in two years. But we learned from previous lulls that we cannot expect this period to last forever. Now is the time to invest in research and infrastructure that can detect the next pandemic variant as early as possible, determine what communities will be at high risk of surges, and implement protective measures and communication strategies to minimize incidents of severe and fatal infection. Our witnesses here today exemplify a broad umbrella of COVID preparedness and response. Today, we'll discuss the great strides that have been made in vaccines and therapeutics to prevent and treat COVID-19, and what more research must be done to ensure a robust response to future variants. We'll talk about public receptiveness to behavioral mitigation measures and how these tools can be scaled up or eased back based on the best available information. We'll unpack what goes into that information, what metrics must be, um, we must get better at collecting, and how, we, and how we can most effectively analyze these metrics to determine the relative risk in our communities. And we'll discuss how that information is best communicated at the individual level to ensure that people are empowered with the facts and tools that they need to protect themselves and their families. Entering a new phase of the pandemic does not mean that we've declared victory over the virus, nor does it mean that we are resigning ourselves to a never-ending state of crisis. <clears throat> the landscape has changed immensely in the past two years, and that is a testament to the incredible research that's been done on how the virus and how we behave. Unfortunately, as public health guidance shifts to incorporate new information, it's all too often interpreted as being flaky or unreliable. Uh, changing recommendations regarding mask wearing are looked at with skepticism, and research on vaccine efficacy in the face of new variants causes everything from cynicism to panic. I'm often struck by how navigating through this crisis resembles the job of an ancient sea captain. A captain should not be criticized for changing course as the wind shifts, but any captain who deliberately ignores signals of an approaching storm has no place at the helm. Today's fair weather may indicate the end of the storm, or we may be simply passing through the eye of the cyclone. And a captain will receive advice from everyone from the grizzled old salts who have survived many stormy passages to young seamen terrified of stories of sea monsters and falling off the edge of the earth. And that was even before social media. And the captain must also answer both to his investors' desire to get the cargo to market on time and to the mothers and children of every person on board. But in the end, what has made sea travel far safer today has been science, the tools of navigation, weather forecasting, ship construction, understanding and treating the chronic vitamin C deficiencies of his crew, and maintaining a proper written record of lessons learned. And we've learned so much about this virus and that reached our shores two years ago, but if this knowledge is not th thoughtfully communicated to the public, the misinformation will fill in the gaps. It's unlikely that we've seen the last surge of COVID-19, and the good news is that we are more prepared than ever to confront what comes. We must seize the opportunity to build upon what we've learned. 
It's imperative that we continue to invest in data tracking and communication capabilities at every level and to ensure public health decision makers have the best information to make recommendations. Misinformation must be confronted thoughtfully and aggressively. Outstanding questions on issues such as long COVID, infection-based immunity, and therapeutics cocktails should be aggressively pursued by scaling up clinical studies. And while we may not be out of the woods yet, uh, we have the opportunity to meet future COVID surges with a clearer eyes and stronger tools. So I look forward to the hearing today from, um, from our witnesses and uh, learning about how we can bolster preparedness efforts in the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I now yield to Ranking Member Obernolte for his remarks. Oh, thank you very much, Captain Foster. <laughs> aye, aye. Uh, and uh, thank you to the chair for convening uh, what, as usual, is a very timely and I'm sure will be a very informative hearing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, we're, we're here in the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and I think it's, uh, you know, a very timely discussion to have to think about the application of science to fighting the spread of COVID and to reflect on the lessons that we've learned over the past couple of years, because as the chair said, uh, this is not something that's over and done with. It's something that we're gonna be dealing with for many years. And it also is something that we have to learn from because uh, this, uh, you know, we, we would hope this would be the last pandemic the world experiences, but uh, history shows that it's probably not going to be. And we certainly would be doing society a disservice if we did not apply the lessons that we've learned here. So uh, I'll tell you a couple of things that I'm looking forward to talking about in this hearing. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that we need to be more holistic about considering what our goals are when we, uh, when we institute public health measures in response to a pandemic, because it, it seems pretty clear looking at what has happened with COVID that focusing on merely containment is probably not the right thing to do. Uh, containment proved to be impossible with many of the variants of COVID. The countries that were the most draconian in trying to contain rather than trying to manage the spread of the virus are the, some of the ones that did the worst in terms of healthcare outcomes. So uh, I, I look forward to having that discussion. And I also think it's time that we acknowledge the fact that when we are contemplating what to do to, to mitigate the spread, uh, that we, uh, that we uh, contemplate all of the uh, societal costs that are borne, uh, not just the health costs. And that's something that we kind of learned to our misfortune through uh, the recent pandemic is that uh, we've got a lot of societal costs that public health officials were not considering when they made some of these decisions. For example, things like learning loss in children, uh, for example, things like behavioral health issues, things like substance abuse issues that occur when people uh, are not allowed to socialize with each other, uh, and certainly the economic costs that are imposed on society by actions like lockdowns. Uh, not to say that any of those are more important than stopping the spread of a variant, but we would be foolish not to consider the fact that the actions that we take as a government do have societal consequences. Uh, and I think that we've determined kind of through this process that, uh, that making these decisions is more complex, that we have to kind of weigh uh, all of these different factors. And although it is difficult to balance something like an economic cost against lives lost, there's, we have to somehow parse that metric. Um, and to, to something that the ranking, the, uh, the chairman just, uh, just mentioned, uh, communication I think is something that we've learned uh, is much more important than we ever thought it was. The, the words that we use when we communicate with the public about the science uh, of an epidemic are critically important. And uh, the fact that we need to maintain the public's trust. Uh, in many cases, I think that we were, we had a kind of a scientific arrogance in our communication with our public over the last couple of years. And that's something that we need to avoid in the future because uh, only through being transparent and honest with the public can we get them to trust us when we tell them that a certain action is the best thing for society. Uh, we certainly can't hide things like uncertainty and uh, tell people that this is the right thing. And then uh, tomorrow tell them that the science has shifted and something else is, is now the right thing to do. Uh, that's gonna shatter their trust. We need to be upfront and honest with them when uncertainty exists. And then lastly, and I'm, I'm, uh, I don't think any of our witnesses today would have the sand to tell us this, but you know, we as public leaders, uh, I think we need to learn by example. And that's something that we've learned to our misfortune. Uh, over the last couple of years. The words that we use are very important and the actions that we take are very important. And I think that uh, events in my home state of California and, and states around the country have proven that when uh, public officials 
uh, are caught not following their own guidance, that is incredibly destructive to public trust. So uh, that's something I think we need to keep in mind as we not only go through this hearing, but as we contemplate the way to handle epidemics in the future. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to the hearing with you and looking forward to see what our witnesses have to say. I yield back. Thank you. And if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses uh, for uh, old salts who have uh, weathered many stormy passages. Our first witness is Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. Uh, Dr. Emanuel is the uh, Levy University professor at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an oncologist, a world leader in health policy and bioethics, and has authored or edited over 350 publications and 15 books. Dr. Emanuel is currently special advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization. He previously served as the founding chair of the Department of Bioethics at the NIH and as a special advisor on health policy to OMB and the National Economic Council. Um, and I will now yield uh, to Mr. Kasten to introduce his constituent and our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are uh, not only the master of your fate, you are the captain of your soul. Um, it is, uh, <laughs> we're going to push this whole hearing. Um, I am uh, um, so grateful and honored to introduce my good friend and Illinois Sixth District Community Health uh, Champion and Expert, Dr. Karen Ayala. Dr. Ayala serves as the Executive Director with the DuPage County Health Department. Prior to that role, she served as the Director of Community Health and Public Health Services since 2007. Throughout her career, Dr. Ayala has worked in community services and public health, bringing a strong commitment to social justice and a creative approach to system design. I'm particularly proud that Dr. Ayala was responsible for the opening and management of a mass testing and vaccination facility in the district that allowed DuPage County to be one of the most successful examples in the country of why high vaccination rates could mean a quicker return to normal for businesses and students. Um, just as a personal note, I am, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for all your great work, Dr. Ayala. The, you know, those moments through the crisis when we had uncertainty about the status of the disease, uncertainty about how supplies of testing and vaccines were gonna be allocated from the feds to the states, from the states to the counties, um, um, learning the science as we went, and of course, the growing politicization of that and all the slings and arrows that were thrown in, in the directions of anybody, including you, you were just consistently such a rock and a beacon of strength and you made us all look better and I know you made our constituents all feel like they were in good hands. So thank you, Dr. Ayala, for your service to our state, to our country, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. And following Ms. Ayala, our next witness is Dr. Lucy McBride. Dr. McBride has worked on as an internal medicine physician in Washington, D.C. for nearly two decades. She's also a prominent healthcare educator, mental health advocate, and author of a COVID-19 newsletter, as well as articles published in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and USA Today. Dr. McBride's work aims to increase the awareness of the inseparability of mental health and physical health. Our final witness is Dr. Mariana Matus. Uh, Dr. Matus is a computational biologist by training and the CEO and co-founder of BioBot Analytics. BioBot won multiple entrepreneurship competitions at MIT for its wastewater epidemiology, epidemiology platform. The subject initially used its platform to track opioid usage patterns before pivoting to COVID-19 detection at the beginning of the pandemic. They were selected by HHS to execute a national COVID-19 wastewater monitoring project and have expanded their platform to analyze wastewater treatment plants across the nation for early warning signs of new COVID outbreaks and variants. As our witnesses should know, each of you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in its entirety in the record of the hearing. When you've all completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five, question, five minutes to question the panel, and we will attempt, if time permits, to have two rounds of questions. And we will start with uh, Dr. Emanuel. Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Obernolte, Ober uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be before this committee at this critical juncture for COVID response in our country. As you know, this month marks two years since our first surge and our first lockdown in the country. We've experienced almost a million deaths, 80 million cases, 
tens of millions of students whose learning has been affected and hundreds of millions of Americans who have suffered socially and economically because of this pandemic. At this moment, uh, we are at a critical juncture, as I mentioned. We need to confront uh, the situation with some humility. We're certainly gonna have another surge. How bad it is, no one here in the room knows. We know that we're gonna confront some waning immunity from the vaccines. Uh, we are gonna confront some resistance from the virus to some of our interventions. How bad all of these things are, we don't know. The only way to stay ahead of SARS-CoV-2 virus and to get a handle and to go into the next normal smoothly is to scale up our physical, our virtual, and our human infrastructure to combat this. As human beings, as a society, we are bad at prevention. Prevention does something in the future. Uh, it requires investing today for a return tomorrow, and we're not constitutionally by nature good at that. We always underinvest in prevention. There are loads of data about how individually we do that and how socially we do that, but we can't do that going forward. Over the last few months, I've convened 25 of the country's leading experts on COVID to create a strategic roadmap for the country. I've submitted that roadmap as a written testimony. I wanna highlight six points from it. First, we need a viral dashboard to follow, to determine when we need to impose public health measures, when we can relieve them safely, how to go forward, and when we're gonna be in the next normal. That dashboard has to include at least five critical items. Vaccination rates, seroprevalence of the virus of immunity in the community, wastewater testing, and you'll hear about that from others, the health system stretch, how close to the peak we are, and of course, death rates in the community. All of those need to be looked at. Truth be told, we're not there yet in measuring these five elements. We need a surveillance infrastructure that is bolstered up to measure four important things on a continuous basis. The wastewater in this country, we need standardization of that wastewater. We need it for more communities than we have it. We need to measure population immunity, which we don't do a good job of. We need to measure genetic variants. We don't do a good job of that. And we need to measure animal reservoirs, zoonotic surveillance. We need to have a platform and have that data available in real time. We don't have that today. That is the second item. The third item is we need to invest in vaccines. Right, Our scientific agencies need to rapidly prioritize different kinds of vaccines, mucosal vaccines, different pan coronavirus vaccines. We need a heavy investment in that. Fourth, we need to invest in therapeutics. Yes, we have Evashield today. We have Paxlovid, but they're not enough. Our virus becomes resistant to these things and will more and more as they come out in the community. So we need a heavy investment in therapeutics, especially oral therapeutics that people can take readily. Five, we need an investment in uh, indoor air quality. It was good that OSTP yesterday had a major event, uh, or uh, Tuesday, a major event on indoor air quality, a first recognition by the government of its importance. We need to standardize what good indoor air quality is and enforce it. We also need to use some of our rescue funds to get indoor air quality in schools and child care centers up immediately using portable filters or improvements in uh, uh, the HVAC systems. Finally, we need an urgent, very rapid research into long COVID. The NIH and the CDC have not prioritized this. They have studies, for example, the NIH Recover Study but it's got an aim of 40,000 people and it's only enrolled 1,000 people to date. We need half a million people studied to get going. Let me just remind you, what I've said are investments in the future. They're investments in prevention. They are, should not be considered spending and wasteful spending. This is how we're gonna prevent serious complications from the next surge or the next virus that comes along. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next is Ms. Ayala. 
Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to share testimony and for the warm welcome. DuPage County Health Department is considered a large suburban local health department serving nearly 1 million residents in Northeast Illinois. Incredibly, today marks the 800th day on the front lines of our local public health COVID response. Since January of 2020, we have based our local response on the best available public health data. What are the best data to communicate to our residents? As a local public health official who routinely interacts with residents, community leaders, healthcare partners, the best data are those that are locally and consistently available as near to real time as possible. Early on at the health department, we invested in developing interactive dashboards and easy to use platforms for sharing information that was available within our county. Still, we know being able to describe and analyze detailed in-depth information about who is becoming effective and the potential outcomes and opportunities for treatment is critical to allow us to intervene more effectively and strategically. Unfortunately, due to lingering data system and interoperability issues, we are yet to meaningfully respond to these reasonable expectations of our constituents. A new challenge around data infrastructure is related to the rapid rise in at-home tests in the absence of a robust reporting and surveillance system to capture, capture these results and information about those testing positive. As a result, we once again risk creating ad hoc, uncoordinated, inefficient efforts that will ultimately limit our ability to analyze broader trends and waste precious resources in the absence of a coordinated effort. We request investments in electronic data sharing practices across healthcare and federal leadership to promote the development of data sharing standards. Those are critical to our ability to collect, analyze, and report back to our communities in standardized ways. We have repeatedly learned that when communicating with the public, it is critical for public health agencies to be speaking in a coordinated fashion with one voice. While the CDC, the executive branch, and our other federal agencies are responsible for formulating national gu guidelines across our response efforts, many of these announcements were made suddenly or unexpectedly. Local health officials were left in an avoidable position of scrambling to evaluate and develop local messaging that would assist our residents both to understand as well as to implement those guidelines. What is, after all, the value of even the most sound public health guidance if no one can explain what it means or how it applies to me? We must refocus our collective work to coordinate communication between local, state, and federal agencies now in order to be better prepared for the next surge and the next public health emergency by rebuilding that structure. Finally, I'd like to highlight the need for sustained investment in local public health departments and the public health infrastructure to enable us to address the ongoing public health challenges that already existed, as well as to be prepared to respond to future emergencies. We know there is a huge chasm between the per capita spending for public health services when compared with spending for traditional health care services. Now is the time, however, I believe we can agree that our priorities for preventing severe disease, illness, and death can be and must be in closer alignment with the priority of simply treating those conditions through our funding decisions. Local public health departments need sustained, predictable, disease agnostic funding that can be used to support core public health infrastructure activities upon which disease specific funding can build when the situation and the need further arises. Investing in these core public health capabilities will strengthen and support all the work done by local health departments. And it will also assure more effective use of all healthcare resources. Thank you so much to Chairman Foster to Congressman Kasten and all the other esteemed community members for the opportunity to share my perspective and for your work to ensure that we are better prepared 
tomorrow to protect the health, safety, and security of our residents. Thank you. And uh, after Ms. Ayala is Dr. McBride. Good morning, and thank you to Chairs Johnson and Foster and Ranking Members Lucas and Oprah Nolte for inviting me today. My name is Lucy McBride. I'm a practicing primary care doctor here in Washington, D.C. I've been practicing for over 20 years. I see patients from teenagers to 90-year-olds, and I've dedicated my life and my career to helping people understand the inseparability of mental and physical health. As we inevitably face more COVID waves and variants, I worry about the ongoing devastation from the virus itself and about the collateral damage from the mitigations. But perhaps most of all, I worry about the ongoing uh, confusion and anxiety from not knowing, for people not knowing who to trust in a global health crisis. I'm not here today with any political agenda, but rather to share with you what I've learned firsthand, caring for patients almost every day during COVID. Patients who are real people on the receiving end of often confusing guidance and the unfortunate politicization of science. In patient care, trust is the glue. To help patients manage everything from mental and behavioral health to end of life care, I first have to establish a relationship and a, and a rapport. But unfortunately, trust in medicine and public health hangs in the balance, as does our ability to help people get the information and services they need because we have not appropriately acknowledged uncertainty and we've lost sight of what I see as the four fundamental pandemic truths. Number one, the effectiveness of the extraordinary vaccines. Number two, the sophistication of the human immune system. Three, the ability of patients and the public to understand nuance. And four, the complexity of human behavior. I'll give you some examples of how trust has been threatened. The mixed messaging around school safety, booster shots, masks, and infection acquired immunity has inadvertently sparked confusion, fear, and vaccine hesitancy. We've scared parents by suggesting that schools are inherently unsafe. We've terrified vaccinated folks about breakthroughs when the primary three shot series continues to hold up beautifully against death and hospitalization for most people. We've alienated COVID recovered patients by not validating their prior immunity until recently. And we've accelerated mask culture wars by not adequately explaining the difference between a mask mandate and the benefits to an individual of one way masking when they need added protection. We should have more appropriately acknowledged the realities of the vaccines, of the immune system, and of human beings' ability to live in a constant state of emergency to better manage people's expectations and to build trust. People are more likely to take in information and follow guidance when the advice is nuanced, when it's not rooted in fear, and we don't moralize human behavior. Also, when we communicate uncertainty with humility and candor and provide reassurance when appropriate. Just to be clear, I don't blame the CDC or any one person or political party for these challenges. Had our prior president, for example, messaged vaccine confidence, we could have saved countless lives. But when we don't talk straight with the American public and when people lack a trusted guide, the vacuum of trust gets filled with the cacophony of political opportunism, lots of media opinions and celebrities and from internet influencers. And that's exactly what's happened. I see the effects every day in my patients. So how do we build back trust? First, we must acknowledge our past mistakes and abandon mitigations whose harms outweigh the benefits like school closures, mask mandates, and asymptomatic testing in schools. Second, we must be honest about ongoing uncertainties about COVID, like about long COVID, while reassuring people about how well the vaccines and therapeutics drop the risk of serious outcomes. Third, we need to ramp up public health measures that we know work from ventilating public health building, public buildings and scaling up outpatient treatments to legislating paid sick leave. We must surge resources like vaccines and rapid tests to our most vulnerable populations. And last, we must arm people with the tools and guidance they need to manage the future variants and the myriad other health issues that are that plague us before the pandemic and that only got worse during COVID, specifically the epidemics of obesity, substance use disorders, and the worsening mental health crisis, particularly among young people. To that end, we must allow every American unfettered access to a primary care hub with integrated behavioral and, and mental health services. We should heavily invest in school-based health centers, starting with marginalized communities to meet teens and kids where they are, exactly like the ones run by my pediatrician friend, Dr. Anna Kaskin here in DC. Clinics that are annexed to those high schools that serve our highest risk teens. 
Primary care providers specialize in building trust and rapport. We get the medical vulnerabilities are, are of our unique patients. We get their biases and beliefs. We understand their unique resources and risk tolerance. Being human is risky. Eliminating risk is impossible. It's the job of public health and primary care to help people manage the everyday risk they inevitably face. COVID is here to stay and we are not done. We'll never be done protecting the most vulnerable. We must give people a place to go, someone to trust. By investing in primary care, we're investing in people and that is the birthplace of trust. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And next is Dr. Matus. Good morning, Chairman Foster and Ranking Member Overnalty. I am Mariana Matus. I'm the CEO and co-founder of BioBot Analytics, a wastewater epidemiology company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is an honor to testify before you today about how wastewater epidemiology can help the U.S and the world better manage the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. BioBot was founded in 2017 with a mission to transform wastewater into actionable public health data. Just yesterday, we had the honor of being recognized as one of the most influential companies of 2022 by Time Magazine for our novel approach to COVID-19 tracking. Everything we eat, the infectious pathogens in our bodies, and the medicines we use are all excreted in our urine and stool and end up in the wastewater. BioBot collects this data in order to understand population health trends. In March 2020, our team was the first in the US to successfully report the detection and quantification of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. To date, we have tested samples from more than 700 communities across all 50 states, including US territories and tribal nations, helping local officials track the spread of the virus as well as variants of concern. In fact, our work includes analysis from wastewater from almost every congressional district represented by this subcommittee. Wastewater data is a leading indicator of new COVID-19 cases because infected individuals shed the virus in their waste several days before they develop symptoms. And this type of monitoring is holistic and it's equitable. It captures anyone who uses the bathroom, including people who are asymptomatic or lack access to healthcare. This means that wastewater data allows us to better understand the presence of COVID, regardless of socioeconomic status or racial composition. Another advantage is that it preserves individual privacy as wastewater represents an aggregate sample of all human waste in a community. One sample drawn from a wastewater treatment plant is representative of tens of thousands of people and testing wastewater is much cheaper than the alternative of testing each of those persons individually. At this stage of the pandemic, we are witnessing fewer reported COVID-19 cases because at-home antigen tests are now widely available and vaccination has boosted the population's immunity. As a result, clinical testing data has become less reliable and public health officials are forced to rely on lagging indicators of the disease, such as hospitalizations and deaths. That is why we believe wastewater monitoring will play an even more important role in containing the spread of the virus as life returns to the new normal. Our, our work in Massachusetts has already demonstrated how powerful this data can be to inform decision-making. Our data is public. From Governor Baker receiving weekly briefings on wastewater data to the chief medical officer at Boston Children's Hospital, down to me as a new mom to a baby, we all review this data to determine how to manage our little piece of the world. To help facilitate the adoption of this new type of data, BioBot recommend Congress 
and the administration take the following steps. First, assist states and localities who have started their own wastewater monitoring programs through consistent funding. Second, empower relevant federal agencies to support wastewater monitoring efforts across the country, especially by standardizing testing and data collection methods. Third, align federal support behind wastewater as a pathogen agnostic technology that can monitor for many different public health threats beyond COVID-19, for example, the seasonal influenza. It can be as simple as a health map, similar to a weather map, or as complicated as an electronic health record. It's up to us to decide how to handle this new resource. I look forward to answering your questions and thank you again for this opportunity. Well, thank you. And at this point, we will begin our first round of questions. The chair will now recognize himself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Emanuel, to uh, oversimplify a bit, uh, transitioning into the new normal for COVID-19 means assessing the risk level to a particular individual or community at, um, at a given time and adjusting the precautions accordingly. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, puts this calculation on a massive scale. Uh, this is an exercise that the public health community must conduct uh, in real time on myriad issues. So what are the lessons that we can draw from past public health crises and even just ongoing public health risk? And when considering the level of risk that might be considered acceptable by the general population, and how do we quantify at what point increased mitigation member measures are actually worth the cost? Keep forgetting to unmute myself. Uh, Chairman Foster, uh, that is an excellent question. And as I said, there's not one indicator we can follow. We need five indicators at least, and we need thresholds on those indicators. Again, they need to be vaccination rates, population immunity in the community. Uh, we need to have uh, wastewater testing. We need to look at uh, hospital and health system overload, and we need to look at the death rate. Um, but as you point out, and ac actually as uh, uh, Ms. Um, Dr. Matsu, Matsuyu, sorry if I mispronounce your name, has just pointed out, we need to bring it down to the local level. Um, and we can do that because each one of those metrics can be done on a population basis. And we need the information in each community and be able to give them a dashboard for the country, but a dashboard for the community. And they need to see where the lines are where we need to take added protections and where we can ease off the protections. Um, and I think adding in population immunity and wastewater testing will give us a very good handle, not a perfect handle, but a good handle on what's coming down the pike in a week or two weeks uh, so that people can prepare. Um, I think this is something that's gonna be critical uh, going forward, having that kind of dashboard. And I do appreciate the CDC's new dashboard. I don't think it encompasses everything we want. But remember, the dashboard's only as good as the data. And as you've heard from others on this panel, um, which I totally support, is we need an upgrade in those data, more real-time data, more standardization, and getting all communities to give it. And the federal government needs to give funding in exchange for people collecting the data in a reliable way and giving it to the federal government and localities to use. Thank you, and I guess, Dr. McBride, um, how do we deal with, a, with recognizing that different costs are imposed on different segments of the population and different benefits? You know, we ran into this with that one of the major reasons to get uh, younger people, uh, young healthy people vaccinated was simply to protect the elderly in our society. And so you couldn't argue this only on an individual basis, but for a population which may be different than your own group. Uh, so what, is, what, what are the lessons learned and the best approaches to trying to deal with that? Well, I think we have to realize, first of all, that in the panic spring of March 2020, it made sense to treat children and elderly people the same because we didn't know exactly who was most at risk for severe outcomes from COVID. But we're now in March of 2022. We have abundant data to show exactly who is at highest risk for poor outcomes. It's older patients. It's, it's patients with immune compromised states, it's people with underlying health conditions, um, and it's people in marginalized communities who don't have the access to needed information and resources to protect themselves and their families and their communities. 
So I think what we need to do is, 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 is um, as Dr. Emanuel was just saying, make sure we have evidence and data on hospitalizations that's stratified by age, vaccination status, race, so that we understand exactly who's at higher risk so that we can surge our limited resources to the most vulnerable populations and then, and then appropriately calibrate the mitigation measures to the level of actually actual risk in that population. For example, subjecting young, healthy college kids to mandates for boosters when they've, for example, had COVID-19 and have had two or three shots already doesn't make sense. It does make sense, though, to focus on surging the fourth shots to people who have A, not had recent COVID, and B, who are at highest risk. And of course, getting first shots, second shots in, first and foremost. But I think the larger question here is really, how do we message to various populations? How do you tell my immunocompromised patient, you know, one piece of advice and a college student whose risk for depression and anxiety is more than their risk of COVID. And that is ultimately the job of the primary care doctor to help take broad public health advice and marry it to the person in front of us. Thank you. And my time has expired and I will now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I'm fascinated by this discussion about uh, the data necessary to make good decisions in the future and uh, how those decisions are made. And so uh, let me start with Dr. Emanuel. Uh, you, in your testimony, talked about the need for a viral dashboard with reliable data on things like vaccination rates, wastewater testing, community immunity, things like that. Uh, and I agree that, that all of those are things that we need better data on. Um, but, you know, as scientists, sometimes we pretend that if we had all the right data, we could make the perfect decisions. And I think everyone would acknowledge that in the case of decisions about COVID, the decision-making process is more complicated. And uh, some of the things that we, we did not consider over the last couple of years are the societal costs that are concomitant to the decisions that we make about things like uh, uh, shutdowns and, and uh, and mandatory vaccination and things like that. So uh, I'm fascinated because your, your background in bioethics, I think this is something you probably thought about. You know, how do you navigate that space? And don't you need data about when you're considering a shutdown, what the economic costs are, what are the costs on behavioral health? You know, how, how do you parse all that? So first of all, I think you're 100% right. We are making trade-offs and we're making trade-offs on major things that don't look, as we say in the field, commensurable mental health versus, uh, you know, getting kids back to school or mental health versus uh, putting people into poverty because we've shut down businesses. Um, I don't want to look self-interested, but I think understanding better and trying to create more models about how we do as human beings make those decisions is something that is worth thinking about and investing in. But I would tell you, um, I do think uh, there was a false narrative out there that, well, the public health people weren't considering these other factors like education or uh, the economy. We saw from the public when rates went way up of COVID, they themselves, before any public health measures were introduced, stepped back from engaging in commercial activity, not being social, keeping their kids home from school. And so there was a very close correlation between fighting the infection and um, uh, getting the economy going. It's very hard to get the economy fully going until we've got this fully under control and the risks to us of COVID and other respiratory illnesses are lower are, are at a low enough threshold that we think they're worth taking. I don't think we're quite there in large measure, in my opinion, because we don't know anything really about long COVID um, and we need to get understanding of long COVID. We know that if you're vaccinated with three doses, uh, uh, three shots, your chance of dying are about one in 30,000. That's a very low risk. And we would go back to normal if there were no long COVID. The long COVID element to it, unknown, unknown who gets it, unknown what the risks actually are, I think complicates this and complicates weighing all the things you said. Let me finish with one point. I think going forward, it's quite clear to all of us here that closing the schools um, was a mistake. Uh, that we could put in better indoor air quality, wearing masks, and have in-person learning, which would have been so important for the students. 
school should be the last thing we close um, and uh, they should stay open as long as possible. Um, we shouldn't be opening restaurants before we open schools. That seems like we have our values quite wrong. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you've illustrated some of the, the fundamental problems there. And you know, the economic decision is actually, as you say, the most difficult. But I mean, even in the space of public health, when you talk about the effect on something like uh, future substance abuse or the thing, the, the domestic violence. You know, uh, I, I think it's it's really hard to uh, to uh, you know to to make decisions just based on stopping the spread of uh, of uh, a contagion. Um, uh, let me uh, let me ask one last question of uh, Miss Ayal. You know, in your testimony, you were talking about the. Uh, need for the availability of uh, more of the at-home testing information. And I'm of the opinion that we actually made some bad decisions early in the pandemic about prioritizing PCR testing over antigen testing because PCR testing we know to be more reliable. But uh, in reality, antigen testing, we would have gotten a lot more data about that. Uh, I'm curious, do you think that that was a bad decision? And then uh, if you could also address uh, the privacy issues involved with gathering that data, I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much for those questions. Yes, I think that um, acknowledging that PCR testing has unique components and is considered to be the gold standard for testing, for viral testing, um, is a no-brainer. However, if the goal is to get as many people tested as possible and results turned around as quickly as possible, then the antigen testing is something that we um, probably should have explored and built systems to support much earlier. Um, the, the idea of, um, uh, of uh, privacy issues uh, surrounding um, testing is something that uh, public health has uh, centuries of uh, addressing in, in much, with much more sensitive kinds of um, disease and virus activity. So I think that even if we did a, a, an opt-in type of um, opportunity for individuals who were um, getting antigen tested and using their at-home tests, we still would be further ahead than we are right now. Right. Well, thank you. I see my time is over. Thank you for the indulgence, Mr. Chair. I'll yield back. Thank you. And we'll now recognize Representative Dr. Barra for five minutes of questions. Great, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, really appreciate the, the panel and the, the witnesses, um, super important information. Um, I, I'll, I'll plug a piece of legislation that we've just reintroduced, the Tracking Pathogens Act, which would you know, plus up the, the budget for both gene sequencing, but also for what you've talked about in terms of um, wastewater surveillance you know, throughout the, the country. So you know, it's a good bill, folks should sign on to it. Um, Dr. Emanuel, let me ask you a question, and this is may, maybe one off, it's something that, that we've talked about a little bit um, previously. One of my biggest concerns is we obviously have seen vaccine hesitancy you know, spring up around the COVID vaccines and, and so forth. And you know, my home state of California, you know, we previously did have you know an anti-vax movement, but it was really largely um, a, a small percentage of the population. I have a big fear as you know we come out of COVID or we go into this next phase, what that spillover effect may be. We know COVID, you know, does minimal um, harm to our children, but if the anti-vax movement now spills over into routine childhood vac vaccines like measles and so forth, I really um, you know, worry very much about what may happen um, in that. And again, our are you seeing any of that trend in terms of routine vaccination rates? You're 100% right, uh, Dr. Barra, um, which is we have seen in the country a substantial drop in childhood vaccinations. Uh, some of that is getting being able to get to the doctor feeling safe going to the pediatrician's office. Some of that is an, a spillover effect of the anti-vax movement. Um, and I do think this is something that we have to confront uh, dramatically. We need to make it clear that this is both a personal and a, a responsibility and a community responsibility, and that these vaccines are very safe. They're very safe, whether they're COVID vaccines or DPT or MMR, 
uh, compared to almost anything else we do, like driving a car, going swimming. Um, and we have to change the mental attitude in this country uh, that vaccines are something we have to do and we're obliged to ourselves, our family, and our community to do. We care about all of that. Um, and people have to see these vaccines as helping uh, make a healthy community. Dr. McBride, you're on the, the front lines um, still practicing, and I'd, I'd be curious what you're seeing in your practice with your patients. And then, you know, again, what we should be thinking about from the congressional perspective to, to change this narrative in the most effective way. Thank you, Dr. Barra. I really appreciate the question because I have a lot of patients, most of my patients are vaccinated and firm believers in vaccines as I am. Um, I have a handful though who are vaccine hesitant and the way I've been able to convince my patients to get vaccinated or even consider getting vaccinated is by using that trust and rapport that I've built over time by listening to their understanding. I mean, let's face it, people in the United States have historical and ongoing real reasons for distrusting the medical institution. And that needs to be heard. People need to be seen and they need to be understood and not shamed or blamed for not getting vaccinated. Um, the second thing I would say is that there's a recent study in JAMA from last month showing that vaccination rates increased with the number of PCPs per capita. So again, I'm a little biased, I'm a primary care doctor, but that is what we do. You know, I, can't, I can have the best vaccine in the world like we do now, um, but if I don't have the trust of my patients and I can't convey nuanced information and meet people where they are, respecting their lived experience and their biases and beliefs, then I really can't make headway or deliver the, the services that person needs. And so again, I think we need primary care to help meet people where they are. Well, I'm a primary care internist, so I'm not practicing right now, so, so I hear that. I guess in the, the sh short time that I have left, and, and maybe I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Emanuel, with regards to long COVID, it is something that, that you know we're concerned about, we're thinking about allocating the resources and trying to better understand it. Where would you want Congress to focus right now in terms of better understanding long COVID? So the first thing is we need to make sure that the NIH and the CDC understand this is an emergency and not usual academic research. And I can say that as an academic. This has to be turbocharged. Second, we need to expand their trials. The estimate by the GAO is at least 8 million people have long COVID, 10% of the people who've gotten COVID, maybe as high as uh, uh, 23 or 24 million. There are many millions of people we can enroll. We need to enroll them in studies to find out what the actual rate is, what the risk factors, what increases the chance of long COVID, what decreases it. Do vaccines protect? Does Evashield protect? Do other treatments protect? The last thing we need to do is we need to start immediately doing clinical trials. We don't understand the biology. That doesn't prevent us from trying things like, you know, steroids or statins or SSRI inhibitors, things that have been shown or suggested to lower the risk of COVID. Maybe they lower the risk of long COVID. Immune modulators. Those three things. What's the risk of COVID? What affects your risk of COVID, improves or reduces your risk of long COVID? And finally, starting clinical trials for therapeutics that might curtail long COVID, all very important and need to be done immediately before the end of 2022, we should begin to have answers. Great. Thank you. I see my time's expired, so yeah. I will yield Thank back. you. And we'll now recognize a Representative Vice for five minutes of questions. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. McBride, did you want to comment on that really quickly? Oh, I just wanted to comment on the fact that what I see in, in my patients and what I what I see in the public square is 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 necessary and real concern about about long COVID. I have patients with long COVID. I have a nurse who got COVID back in 2020 and is still suffering from the fallout, loss of taste, smell, brain fog. It's real. It is absolutely real. At the same time, I think in the public, based on what I'm observing and what I understand based on the studies that have done that have not well controlled, they're not well controlled studies is that there seems to be an outsized fear of long COVID that again, this is not to dismiss people's fear. This is not to dismiss people's lived experience. This is not to dismiss people who are living with long COVID. My, 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 my point is about the messaging and the, 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 the difficult threading of the needle that we need to do as clinicians and that we need to do as public health leaders 
reassuring people where reassurance is warranted because we see based on the data so far that vaccines do reduce the risk of long COVID. Um, we need more research, but we also can reassure people and not um, scare people unnecessarily when they've been vaccinated. So um, on that note, first of all, I want to I want to thank uh, Dr. Emanuel for mentioning uh, not, um, uh, you know, sending kids home from school. I think that's incredibly important. And we have seen the detriments of that across the country. Every socioeconomic demographic is being affected by kids being home. So I appreciate your comments on that. Dr. McBride, I want to ask you this question. Um, I had a conversation with a pediatrician recently who um, was asked, obviously is very interested in these conversations. And she asked the question, do you think if a fourth booster is going to be um, required or uh, recommended by the CDC? And I said, you know, I doubt it. Um, but her concern was the virus that we're seeing today, these sort of um, mutations that we're seeing today are vastly different than what we saw two years ago. And her concern is that the vaccines have not been um, uh, modified at all to be able to affect that. What are your thoughts on that? So lots of thoughts. One is that I think we need to do a better job of managing people's expectations of what the vaccines can do. The vaccines are no doubt the, the clearest way forward through the pandemic and through the next waves and set of variants. Um, but we also need to make clear to the general public that vaccines are not magic force fields and they don't protect against infection like they did pre-Delta. So we shouldn't be surprised, for example, if someone has a breakthrough infection despite three or even four shots, but the fact that they're not in the hospital, they're not severely ill, is a vaccine success. And that messaging is the nuance that has unfortunately, I think, been lost so that people, like in my practice, have been terrified by getting a breakthrough infection saying, oh my gosh, my vaccine doesn't work. When actually, if you're at home with the flu, not that it's the flu, it's a di different virus altogether, that is your vaccine working. So to answer your question, I don't have a crystal ball and I would be lying if I knew what was happening in the future. Um, but I do think we will see new variants and we will see more waves. And I think ultimately what we'll end up seeing is, is new formulations of the vaccine to target the variant at hand, not and unlike think, what we do with the flu. Right, and that's, I think her point was the flu is an annual um, mutation or variant and, and we're having to uh, recreate those vaccines every year. We should be looking at that uh, for COVID as well because we are seeing these mutations as we move through time and they may change. I also wanna say, I agree 100% with your assessment about communication. I thought from the very beginning, um, it should have been okay for the CDC, NIH and others to say, we don't know yet. We don't know yet, we're still doing research. But instead of that, we heard a lot of information that, that ended up being either incorrect or modified later on no masking, double masking, um, no masking if you're vaccinated. And I think to your very well uh, made point, people become distrusting if, they're if the message is constantly being changed, right? And so w one of the things I wanna see from uh, our health um, officials here is, you know, understand that you can say, I don't know, this was a disease that we've never seen before. And we didn't know, if you think back to March of 2020, um, people thought that, you could get it by touching, you know, your groceries at the grocery store. I mean, it was really sort of kind of crazy times, but now we know a, a lot more about it. And I think that messaging builds confidence in the medical community so that people will be more comfortable taking the vaccine, being, you know, willing to get a booster if necessary. Um, but this, but this constant shift in that messaging makes people incredibly distrusting. And that's why we're seeing, I think, such high numbers. The other thing I'll quickly add to is we mentioned um, vaccination rates. I think there are two reasons. Certainly um, not having access is a big deal, especially for low income uh, families. When you have health departments that have been closed or clinics that have been closed only to uh, COVID vaccines, that becomes a problem for children. Um, and, and, the, and then the other piece of it is educating these parents that the, the vaccines that have, we've been taking, uh, you know, DPT, um, the MMR vaccines are safe and effective. And that's why we don't have those, um, those diseases across the country. So my time has expired. I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, and at this time, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And for our members, there are, will be a second a brief round of questions as, as well. And we will now recognize Mr. Kasten for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Ayala, I have to start with a confession. I've, I've never admitted this publicly, so bear with me. Um, the Harvard School of Public Health has maintained a list throughout the whole COVID pandemic showing the uh, vaccination rate by congressional district, and I have taken sole credit for the fact that the 6th District of Illinois has consistently been the most vaccinated district um, in the state, and uh, and I really don't deserve that. Um, you're 50% of my constituents, so, uh, <laughs> so credit where credit is due. You deserve credit for that. And of course, you've led on testing as well. And it's and I you know I meant everything I said about how fortunate we are to have you there. Um, I also don't think I'm putting any words in your mouth to say that both of us probably wish those numbers were higher. And I, 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 I want to start just by asking you to reflect a little bit. Throughout, certainly through the first year of this pandemic, there was a the demand for everything exceeded the supply, whether that was the demand for PPE or for ventilators and then for testing and then for vaccines. And in theory, there's an optimal public health way to allocate those scarce resources. In practice, as you and I know too well, um, some of those decisions were political. There were situations where, you know, it, it, we certainly got in a challenge here as far as intrastate allocations. And then once they were at the state level and the county allocations. and. I wonder now that we're sort of, you know, hopefully on the back end of this, was all of that tension completely inevitable, or do you think there are things that we could have done better at the federal or state level to ensure that that scarce resource allocation was done collaboratively rather than competitively? So that's a that's a very provocative question, and um, I think that to a certain extent, when you're allocating limited resources, there will inevitably be um, contentiousness and um, uh, and and um, unhappiness. Um, however, I think the lesson learned, and I, I remember the conversations that you and I had, um, transparency around those decisions at the time, as well as um, benchmarks or metrics for how the decisions are being made. Um, I think those are the tools that could um, not, not eliminate, but certainly reduce some of that um, unnecessary um, angst. Uh, well, here, here, we could talk for a long time about that. I want, I want to shift, though, if we can, to the mental health issue that's come up a couple times. Um, I think we're all keenly aware of, of how much we as a people need social engagement and how much we've become a little bit sort of socially crippled, for lack of a better word, as we've uh, been in our, in our bubbles over the last year. At the same time, there's a part of me as an American that, that gets confused and, and in, in some ways angry at the fact that the same country that was willing to completely transform the way we travel, our rights to data privacy, enter into 20-year wars after 9-11, is not even talking about the fact that we lost two 9-11s last week. Um, almost a million Americans, and somehow we've either at best decided that we're just inured to it, and at worst decided that that's an acceptable price to pay so that somebody's kid doesn't have to wear a mask, or that somebody can have the freedom not to get vaccinated because that's more important. And I don't want to trivialize those mental health issues, but. You, of course, oversee a pretty robust mental health division as well um, out in Wheaton. And I wonder how you think about the trade-off between the public health issues of saving lives and, and the real mental health issues you see, how you, how you think about that, how you communicate it, how we should think about it. Sure. So when we, when we talked about earlier in this hearing, when we talked about the impact of COVID on children, um, I think one of the one of the opportunities that we did not take full advantage of from the public health standpoint um, in in working with families around the need for children to get vaccinated, as well as the importance of masking and some of the others is the impact of the loss of uh, someone close to them. When we look at the reports around um, children who have been orphaned um, and lost that primary caregiver again. The most dramatic um, losses have occurred in our marginalized, underserved populations. Those children, not that any child um, needs to, to uh, you know, experience trauma to, to build any sort of character going forward, but those are kids um, who, who absolutely need people in their lives who are steady and um, supportive for them. I, I think that I, I, I share your concern that um, 
when we talk about the numbers and in DuPage County alone, we have, um, we have nearly 2000 deaths that have occurred over the last uh, two years. Um, in, in large part, um, unnecessarily and tragically too soon and, and preventable now that we know that there's, um, this is a vaccine preventable disease. I think that um, to us in public health and health, the, the, the most tragic outcome is having a death in an otherwise um, healthy individual. And so when we talk about the concerns of economics and concerns about restaurants and bars staying open, um, I, I think that we need to, to take a really deep look at what is important from a community standpoint. And I know I'm over, but one of the issues that we've all talked about is the need for schools to have been open without a doubt. However, when we had other facets of our society who were unwilling um, to, to abide by some of the prevention strategies so that we could get back kids back in school, I think that's when, we, that's when um, the priorities of a community um, are felt more than they're heard. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. And at this point, we'll start a second round of questions for members who are interested. Um, and I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Manuel, you mentioned three uh, interesting technologies that you thought we should, uh, uh, that we should pursue actively. Uh, seroprevalent surveillance, mucosal vaccines, and antiviral cocktails. Uh, so first, in terms of the seroprevalence surveillance, uh, does technology exist to really, you know, take one of these little blood spot tests where you, um, you know, you prick your finger and put it on something that looks like a business card, you mail the business card back in, and then that can be analyzed for antibodies, for example, that may be present. But is there a way, um, does technology exist to actually use that sort of test to predict whether or not you're actually immune to a specific variant? You can't predict whether you're immune to a specific variant. You can predict whether you've got antibodies to variants, um, and you don't need to get people to actively prick necessarily. We can use what's called the excess blood uh, from laboratory tests. We do millions of tests every day in this country, and we can use some of that excess blood to monitor uh, these uh, antibodies. The other problem I would mention with that is that we have uh, cellular immunity, which is what gives us our long-term immunity against COVID. And that's uh, much harder to monitor uh, uh, in the way that you suggest. But the other technologies we need, mucosal vaccines, pan-coronavirus uh, vaccines, multi-drug cocktails, uh, those are all uh, very important. And we're doing research. We need to, again, turbocharge the research. Let me just conclude with one other item, which is not a technology so much as research. You can't tell me, I can't tell you, and no one in the country can tell you what the optimal vaccine schedule is. We have different kinds of vaccines. We probably th know that mRNA first and mRNA repeatedly is probably not optimal, but we can't tell you is having J&J &J first and then an mRNA optimal is maybe having the new Novavax vaccine, if assuming it gets approved with mRNA, is that optimal? We need research on that too, because we may actually get better community uh, uh, protection and immunity uh, with a different schedule of just the vaccines we have. And we just don't know what's optimal out there. Again, another research hole that we need to fill. And one thing that's not really a technical issue, but I've been very struck, as, as all of us have, uh, trying, you know, we're trying to convince people who are hesitant to get vaccinated, and I, we've all spent hours and hours doing that. And very often, you know, at the end of the discussion, you haven't succeeded. And then one of the things that I have tried doing is to uh, ask people that if, instead of a vaccine, it was simply a pill that you took, almost universally people say, oh, yeah, sure, I'd take a pill. And so even though it's not a technical issue on the performance of such a vaccine, it seems to me that if we prioritize the development of, say, an oral vaccine or one of these you know, nasal spritzer things, I think there, there might be a huge uh, increase in vaccine acceptance. And uh, is there anything, do any of our witnesses know, has that sort of thing been studied as a technique to get past um, vaccine hesitancy? I totally agree with you. 
It's uh, that's why I call for mucosal vaccines. Um, having a variety of approaches for people is absolutely pivotal. And you're hundred percent right. People are more inclined to do a pill uh, or a spritz in the nose um, than they are for whatever reason, shots have very, very bad overtones for people. Yeah, I think we're kind of built that way. You know, I recently became a, a granddad, and so babies will often put stuff in their mouth with no uh, hesitation at all, and they have never seen a baby eager to be uh, injected with something. Um, um, now, in terms of the antiviral cocktails, this is something I've been frustrated by uh, because I don't see, frankly, much federal action on this. I, we led a bipartisan letter a while ago that doesn't seem to have had much effect. There, one of the problems, there is no real commercial incentive for the manufacture of a, of a reasonably successful antiviral to uh, be enthusiastic about sponsoring uh, uh, cocktail uh, clinical trials. And it's, it's my understanding that actually held back uh, the development of HIV cocktails for actually years. Um, and so is, is there any observations that any of our witnesses have about uh, the importance there or what Congress might do to encourage the development of antiviral cocktails? I'll just say, if I could, um, that that I think the the development of Paxlovid, for example, as an oral antiviral is really a game changer. And I applaud Biden's test to treat initiative. And I think we need to really surge resources there so that people, as you said, who are either vaccine hesitant or unvaccinated or, 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 or vaccinated and still get COVID and are at higher risk for poor outcomes um, can quickly get a rapid test show that they're positive and get the appropriate antiviral treatment to further reduce their risk for, for serious outcomes from COVID-19. Thank you. I do think advanced purchase agreements uh, could incentivize this and specifically allocating money uh, to conduct rapid trials on uh, multi-drug regimens is something we have to prioritize. And I think when you allocate money or appropriate money to the NIH, that's something you ought to put in um, to uh, uh, force them to do it. Uh, they have been resistant to these oral medications right from the start. I can tell you that having had discussions, and that's been a mistake. We have hundreds now uh, in either preclinical or clinical trials of antiviral uh, medications, and we need to turbocharge that too. Thank you, and my time is up. I will now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a really fascinating discussion we're having, and I'd like to continue the line of questioning about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and, and let me just lead by saying that perhaps one of the things that this has taught us is that we need to think more out of the box when it comes to widespread vaccine availability for people, because I, although I will agree that an oral vaccine would be more accepted than an injectable vaccine. Uh, convenience is also important. And I, I know it's, uh, as people in the, the space of public health, it horrifies us to say this, but uh, for a lot of people, the, the necessity of having to go to a healthcare provider to get vaccinated, uh, that, that's a big step for them. I mean, if you got just, if your insurance company just sent you in the mail, the next vaccine dose was an oral vaccine and they said, scan this QR code when you've taken it so that we know you've taken it, we can update your, your medical records. And by the way, you shouldn't take it if you have these symptoms. You know, uh, I actually think that would go a lot further towards making sure that we have good vaccine penetration. Um, so, uh, you know, let me ask, you know, along those lines, uh, Dr. McBride, uh, we'll, I'll pick on you again here. Uh, you've said some really interesting things about vaccine hesitancy in the anti-vax movement. And, and I'll, I'll be provocative and say, I actually think that the government and government action throughout the health crisis has greatly contributed to the rise of the anti-vax movement. I, I think that if we had just been more open and transparent with the public about the fact that vaccines are very effective, they're overall safe, but they do have risks. Uh, and, and I also think that if we uh, had been more respective of people's own ability to decide for themselves whether or not vaccines were right for them, uh, that people would be less hesitant here. Do you, do you agree or disagree with that? And what mistakes do you think that we made during the crisis that, that might have resulted in greater vaccine hesitancy? So thanks for that question. I don't ascribe ill intent to our federal government. I think we've been building an airplane in the air. Well, I can. You, but you I don't do have think... to, but I do. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. Fair enough. Um, 
Um, and as I said, my written testimony had our prior president, you know, gotten the vaccine as he did and told people about it, that would have done a lot of good. I think what this goes back to again messaging and 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 acknowledging uncertainty, acknowledging the truth that we that we know about the vaccine, and and then allowing ourselves, giving ourselves permission to give the public permission to have to feel reassured. So I have so many patients who are vaccinated, boosted, and walking around terrified to see their grandkids, to go back to work when they need to know that COVID isn't going away tragically, but that the vaccine has taken the fangs and claws away from the virus and that they can then focus on their broad human needs. For example, my patients with obesity, hypertension, substance use disorders, we need to be focusing on those issues and, and take fear out of the driver's seat from the, when the, the way they think about COVID while protecting themselves and their families from this virus. So the, the other thing I think we missed the opportunity of doing is we didn't get the vaccines into primary care doctor's offices. Again, trust is, is the ground game in primary care. And if I had the ability to check, see a patient for their annual checkup and say, oh, hey, by the way, there's this COVID shot, it's excellent, what are your concerns? And then have them go get their lab work and their vaccine at the same moment, that would be great. The problem is, as you know, 80 million Americans, according to a recent study, don't have access to a primary care medical home, which is why, again, I think we need to invest in primary care um, and, and allow people to have that place to get nuanced information. Because the CDC, even in, 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 if it was doing the best of jobs in the best of times, can't possibly speak to every American. It can't possibly speak to a vaccine hesitant person and a vaccinated anxious person. That's our job, to be the lieutenants of the CDC, to help people get what they need and to get the, the resources and information they need that, that, are, that, that reflect their unique vulnerabilities and their unique risk tolerances, because there's really no one size fits all prescription for how to manage risk. Sure. I, I completely agree. Uh, and I also think, I mean, you, you've raised an interesting issue, which is we need to be cognizant of uh, behavioral science when uh, we're making decisions about how to increase vaccine adoptance. And that's one of the mistakes I think we made. Uh, you know, it's we have a long tradition of uh, anti-authoritarianism here in the United States. In fact, it's kind of a part of our national ethos. Uh, and as a parent who's raised a couple of kids, I can tell you if I wanted them to eat broccoli, the last thing I should do is to tell them they have to eat broccoli, right? That if, if I instead say, well, okay, you can not eat the broccoli, but you're gonna miss out on something good, they're a lot more likely to eat the broccoli on their own. And I mean, I, I really think that, that there are lessons to be learned there in, uh, in addressing vaccine hesitancy because uh, those are some of the mistakes I think that we made during this process. But it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we'll now recognize uh, Representative Kasten for five minutes of questions. Uh, th th thank you. Um, to, two questions. Uh, first, uh, one more for Dr. Ayala, and I want to get to Dr. Matus before we wrap up here, who uh, has been far too lonely on the screen. Um, the uh, um, when when this pandemic first started, we had some experts come in. Dr. Emanuel, you may have been one, um, advising us on how to talk to the public through a crisis. And the, the the message that stuck in my head was, for goodness sake, don't be the elected official who um, who some significant number of people didn't vote for and say I'm the one who's right. Um, get the public health officials to stand up next to you and speak to that. And certainly availed myself of of your skills in that department more than once, Dr. Ayala. The trouble was then we got home and social media was ablaze with all sorts of completely garbage information that was running contrary to that and we weren't sitting there with the expert on hand. And, and I'm curious, Dr. Ayala, you must have felt that as someone who was communicating this in your soul. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think we can do better for future pandemics about that role of social media and communication and what advice you'd give to us if we were going in now about how to anticipate that sort of nonsense in the future and, and inoculate the public against it. Sure, sure. So I think that um, uh, although although I feel it in my soul, I think one of the ways that I've survived the last two years is to completely divorce myself from reading any um, social media posts or many social media posts. Um, however, I think that um, as far as communication goes, I think that when we stay silent around misinformation and disinformation um, from, from a public health or a health care um, legitimacy, we undermine ourselves. And so I think that 
no, we can't possibly address all of the issues that are br brought up on social media. Um, however, some of the points that Dr. M McBride, Dr. Emanuel have made um, about communicating the nuances around vaccinations, around communicating the nuances around um, the, the need to for layered mitigation that just like there's no one metric, there's no one um, uh, prevention strategy that is going to be the silver bullet. Um, I, I think those would have gone a long way. And instead, I think we just took, um, I don't know, high road or didn't want to get involved in those kinds of um, discussions, but I think it really worked against us. And that would be definitely a lesson learned going forward. Can I can I raise one uh, point or a few points? First, we have to talk about misinformation. It's not just the government giving uh, information that might not be clear. There was plenty of misinformation out there, uh, intentional deception of people. Um, that some of it came from foreign actors. We know that, and we need to see this as a national security threat when they can spread misinformation that compromises the public health of the country. And I don't think we've done that and take it on seriously. Second, the academic studies, at least that I've seen, trace almost all of this back to Fox News and to the misinformation Fox News started, then gets amplified by social media, then comes back to Fox News. And it's a vicious negative circle there. And I think we have to be very clear. Third, we have to change those algorithms and prevent people from staying in an information bubble. You have the power to do it. It's not an infringement of First Amendment rights that people, um, that the companies just can't give you a loop of the same misinformation you get, that you have to be open to information. Um, those algorithms are quite dangerous to public health, but they're also quite dangerous to democracy. And I think it's very important for you to take seriously those algorithms. They don't infringe the public uh, free speech rights, uh, but they do allow us to be demo uh, more in a democracy so we can hear the opposing and alternative views very freely, just as freely as we hear. So Do Dr. Dr. Manuel, thank you. And, I, and I, I, I completely agree, it's a rich conversation. I do just want to get to Dr. Matus and I'm seeing my time run down here. Um, we had um, a whole lot of complication early on, to some degree probably still do with data sharing. Different hospitals had different data systems. They didn't necessarily communicate properly with the community health centers, with the public health departments. And I realize that sewage testing is not the entirety of that, but I'm curious to what degree your data, which is aggregated, um, can tie some of that together just from a data perspective? And then secondarily, to what degree have you been able to work with that diversity of public health systems to use your data to interface and maybe spot gaps and coordinate data between those, if that makes, makes sense in the time we've got left? Absolutely. Um, wastewater data has grown from being this very obscure novelty that people found interesting or even funny to suddenly becoming the new pillar, the most trusted source of truth about what's happening in the pandemic. Just earlier this year during the Omicron wave, the wastewater data, which we make publicly available to everybody just through our website and through social media, uh, indicated when the peak of the clinical cases would happen two weeks ahead of time. It gave hospitals, especially in the Boston area where there's lots of awareness about this type of information, a two week leading time to prepare for the peak. And it was equally useful to know when the peak would happen as well as to when it would end. And that's the promise. That data can be communicated real time to everybody involved. And as you say, the data is seen by the governor. It's seen by the state's public health department. It's seen by the city level public health departments from Boston, Cambridge, Chelsea is seen by the hospitals in the area, is seen by the public and commented by the public on social media. And as they see it, and I will just end with that, you know, the poop data doesn't lie. <laughs> and it's that trust. We need to go back to the basics and wastewater provides that to the public, a public engagement tool. The uh, ending with a comment about the poop deck is a great way to yield back to our captain. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Um, <laughs> we'll now recognize uh, Representative Bice for five minutes. 
Thank you so much. And I actually just want to pivot back to Dr. Matusa. You um, haven't had the opportunity to talk about some of these other topics. I just want to maybe talk, um, ask you if you can maybe elaborate on um, communities that you're utilizing these resources in across the country and how we can educate um, municipalities and states to really um, invest in the type of research and technology that you are currently providing. Absolutely. Something to mention is that um, of all of the communities that currently do wastewater epidemiology, there's a very big fraction of them that are small towns, rural communities, tribal nations, and we work with them. That's part of the beauty of this technology. All that you need is the wastewater. You don't need any pre-existing infrastructure in those areas in order to understand what's happening. In the state of Oklahoma, as well as in others, we have done plenty of work with those communities. And what we're seeing, what seems to be the most uh, resonating with them is feeling part, part of, of this story, feeling part of it. Sure. Um, is there, what is the opportunity for us to utilize um, wastewater uh, research in other areas, maybe, um, you know, it, it, are you able to identify variants of COVID? Are you available? Is it um, parts per million that you can see um, the amount of um, per, you know, per capita maybe um, exposure? Like how does that technology really move us forward? Yes, uh, the wastewater allows you to understand the, the level of disease activity in an area. So the trend, you can see if it's going up, if it's going down. Right now, the COVID-19 levels nationwide are quite stable at a low level, fortunately. There's a little bit of an uptick happening, but nothing yet too concerning. At the same time, and from the same sample, we also analyze for the variants of concern, mm -hmm. clinically of concern variants. So we do genomic sequencing, which was mentioned earlier today as one of the very important tools to pandemic preparedness. And we can understand which mutations are circulating of the known variants, as well as new, new mutations that we don't understand yet. And there's a lot of very interesting work there, not to mention influenza, other infectious diseases, antibiotic resistance, and something that has been mentioned multiple times during this hearing, mental health. Mental health can also be understood through wastewater. Um, both the opioid side, the stimulant side, is all of information that can be collected from the same source. That's fascinating. And I think that um, the comment that you made that you can look at variants, I think is incredibly important as I think everybody on the panel can agree, this isn't going away. Um, and so being able to, to recognize that's important. And can you tell us how long it takes you to analyze this, to, to be able to provide the data back to the municipalities? We provide it, um, yes, next business day. Uh, wastewater is a leading indicator for what's coming. Uh, we have been, you know, it has been officially reported by academic groups, by the CDC, how wastewater gives you an early warning about what you're going to see in the clinic when it comes to the spikes, but also to the variants. Omicron was detected in wastewater before it was seen in the clinic in the US in the last wave. Why we are not utilizing these types of technologies um, holistically, I think is sort of beyond me. So I'm glad to connect with you and I appreciate you being on the panel. Dr. McBride, did you wanna maybe um, chime in there? I just wanted to say how impressed I am by what your, your presentation, Dr. Matus, and just to say how excellent a resource wastewater management can be, particularly when we see the harms of all of the, um, the, 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 the potential harms of, for example, asymptomatic testing in schools. Um, when we have these, these technologies like wastewater testing and we have the ability to ventilate um, buildings, these are, these are invisible and, and private uh, they, they preserve the privacy of, of the public while, you know, alerting people in advance of their risk and, and mitigating the risk. Whereas when you test someone, for example, uh, an asymptomatic child in the school and send them home for a quarantine when they aren't even sick, then, you know, particularly in low resource communities, you put that kid at risk for 
everything from missed school altogether because they don't have access to internet to you know not getting fed um, where so they so right. so so these invisible interventions um, paired with access to primary care to get the nuanced information that you need for your individual risk when Mariana Matus's wastewater poop tests go up. I mean, that's really, to me, the wave of the future. I love it. Well, thank you so much for um, our um, panel being here today. And Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm struck by the amount of interest in, in this technology here on, in a very bipartisan manner. And I'm wondering at some point if you may be asked to um, actually predict the results of election based on wastewater samples. But before we bring this hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before the committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for any additional statements uh, from members and any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. Uh, and this hearing is now adjourned. Chairman and the ranking member, one or two.